Friends, my name is Leslie Kale Villarreal, and I'd like to welcome you to my studio. And I would like to talk to you a little bit about some of the uh, tool requirements for good metal smithing, uh, making things like rings and bezels and uh, pendants and some of the tools that you'll need, just basic stuff. stuff. Um, because I have a lot of friends and peers who, like myself, started out in the jewelry business making uh, stringing beads and um, uh, wrapping wire, uh, making wire jewelry and uh, connecting it with beads and that sort of stuff. Um, and then you move on to bezels and pouring resin inside of your bezels. And then you decide, oh my gosh, um, this is great, but I really need a little bit more. So. Um, where do I go from here? So a lot of people have been asking me how to make things and I love that and um, I just thought it would be a, a lot of them don't know what tools to use or how much they need to invest into their studio and so I just thought I would give you a quick overview of some of the basic tools required for good metal smithing skills uh, to make nice jewelry and um, how to use a torch just a basic torch um, and you know, just uh, kind of paying it forward because there's a lot of really nice people that I've met in this industry that are just so kind and, and, and giving and, and have shared things with me. And um, I'd like to do the same for others. And I thought maybe by making a little video and kind of showing you the things that you might need and want to invest in um, might be helpful for others out there as well. I'm constantly on forums and answering the same questions over and over. People want to know, you know, what kind of a torch do you use and how do you turn it, turn it on and what does your soldering station look like and do I need a tumbler? Um, do you pickle your metal? What is a pickle and what does that mean? So I'm just going to give you some basic information, a little introduction to uh, studio stuff and moving on into metal smithing, kind of a metal smithing beginning, um, if you will. So, um, some of the best places to start. Um, you can learn a lot through books, but if you can't get to someone who um, has a, a class, a class is really a wonderful thing. Uh, I have taken classes at the College of Marin here, and I've learned a lot by being in a studio with some very advanced teachers and students who um, have been doing this for a very long time, and you learn a lot being close to people like that. So if you can get into a hands-on live class, I suggest you do it. Um, you can get a ton of information off of YouTube and, and I've learned a ton there too. So hopefully I'll be able to share a few tips and tricks here and just give you a basic idea of, of what you need to get going if you want to be a ring maker or, or, or a jewelry maker. Um, so um, just starting off, uh, I started off in my kitchen and I didn't have room for tools and now I have a little studio and I the more the more space you have the more tools you want so I have just gathered and collected tools um, like we all do we become tool mongers and it's kind of wonderful to have all these tools I don't know if I'll ever use them all but if I don't I guess I can sell them um, a great place to find used tools is on Craigslist or um, flea markets um, um, garage sales if you can find uh, old jewelers going out of business so that's a really good uh, resource um, but just back to getting started um, it's a really good idea to get a really good book on jewelry making and um, I met a lady on YouTube that was making 18 karat gold jewelry and her stuff was so beautiful and I asked her where do I start you know would you teach me and she said no you don't start with 18 karat gold jewelry making you start with some books and then if you decide that you like it, then you go from there. So that's what I did. Um, I got some books and I started and then I took some classes and went on from there. Um, some great books to start out with are Jinx McGrath. They were recommended to me when I first got them. Let's see if you can see that. It's called The New Encyclopedia of Jewelry Making Technique. This is the, his newest book. Or her, I don't know if Jinx is a man or a woman. Um, and the first book that I got was um, the complete jewelry making course. And there's a little bit of glare there on my on my screen, so I don't know if you can see that very well. Um, these books have some great information on just basic setups uh, and basic tools that you need. Sorry, my doggies are working. Okay, they've stopped. Um, 
but basic tools that you need. So um, I'm just going to go over a list of some basic things that you're going to need, and then I'm going to show you um, my setup and the things that I have, and I'll go over my tools with you, um, and you can decide whether or not this is the right thing for you. And if you do like it, you should invest a little bit of money in a few things and go from there. So um, some of the first tools that you're going to you should have a pair of safety glasses and um, something to cover to, yeah, your mouth and breathe. They're, they're little... Um, Respirators, hang on, I'll show you one. Anytime you're soldering, or, um, because I have a lot of friends and peers who, like myself, started out in the jewelry business making uh, stringing beads and um, uh, wrapping wire, uh, making wire jewelry and uh, connecting it with beads and that sort of stuff. Um, and then you move on to bezels and pouring resin inside of your bezels. And then you decide, oh my gosh, um, this is great, but I really need a little bit more. So um, where do I go from here? So a lot of people have been asking me how to make things. And I love that. And um, I just thought it would be, a, a lot of them don't know what tools to use or how much they need to invest into their studio. And so I just thought I would give you a quick overview of some of the basic tools required for good metal smithing skills uh, to make nice jewelry and um, how to use a torch, just a basic torch um, and you know just uh, kind of paying it forward because there's a lot of really nice people that I've met in this industry that are just so kind and, and, and giving and, and have shared things with me and um, I'd like to do the same for others and I thought maybe by making a little video I'm kind of showing you the things that you might need and want to invest in um, might be helpful for others out there as well. I'm constantly on forums and answering the same questions over and over. People want to know, you know, what kind of a torch do you use and how do you turn it, turn it on and what does your soldering station look like and do I need a tumbler? Um, do you pickle your metal? What is a pickle and what does that mean? So I'm just going to give you some basic information, a little introduction to uh, studio stuff and moving on into metal smithing, kind of a metal smithing beginning, um, if you will. So um, some of the best places to start. Um, you can learn a lot through books, but if you can't get to someone who um, has a, a class, a class is really a wonderful thing. Uh, I have taken classes at the College of Marin here, and I've learned a lot by being in a studio with some very advanced teachers and students who um, have been doing this for a very long time, and you learn a lot being close to people like that. So if you can get into a hands-on live class, I suggest you do it. Um, you can get a ton of information off of YouTube, and, and I've learned a ton there too. So hopefully I'll be able to share a few tips and tricks here and just give you a basic idea of of what you need to get going if you want to be a ring maker or, or, or a jewelry maker. Um, so um, just starting off, uh, I started off in my kitchen and I didn't have room for tools and now I have a little studio and I the more the more space you have the more tools you want so I have just gathered and collected tools um, like we all do we become tool mongers and it's kind of wonderful to have all these tools I don't know if I'll ever use them all but if I don't I guess I can sell them um, a great place to find used tools is on Craigslist or um, flea markets um, um, garage sales, if you can find uh, old jewelers going out of business. So that's a really good uh, resource. Um, but just back to getting started, um, it's a really good idea to get a really good book on jewelry making. And um, I met a lady on YouTube that was making 18 karat gold jewelry and her stuff was so beautiful. And I asked her, where do I start? You know, would you teach me? And she said, no, you don't start with 18 karat gold jewelry making. You start with some books and then if you decide that you like it, then you go from there. So that's what I did. Um, I got some books and I started and then I took some classes and went on from there. Um, some great books to start out with are Jinx McGrath. They were recommended to me when I first got them. Let's see if you can see that. It's called The New Encyclopedia of Jewelry Making Technique. This is the, his newest book. Or her, I don't know if Jinx is a man or a woman. Um, and the first book that I got was um, the Complete Jewelry Making Course. And there's a little bit of glare there on my, 
on my screen, so I don't know if you can see that very well. Um, these books have some great information on just basic setups uh, and basic tools that you need. Sorry, my dog isn't working. Okay, they've stopped. Um, but basic tools that you need. So um, I'm just going to go over a list of some basic things that you're going to need, and then I'm going to show you um, my setup and the things that I have, and I'll go over my tools with you. Um, and you can decide whether or not this is the right thing for you. And if you do like it, you should invest a little bit of money in a few things and go from there. So um, some of the first tools that you're going to you should have a pair of safety glasses and um, something to cover to, yeah, your mouth and breathe. They're, they're little... Um, Respirators, hang on, I'll show you one. Anytime you're soldering or anytime you are um, enameling, you should wear one of these and a pair of safety glasses. First and foremost, so that you don't hit yourself in the eye or breathe in noxious, noxious, noxious gases. Noxious gases. Um, and good ventilation is important too. If you notice behind me, there's a little fan. And that little fan um, kind of sucks my soldering fumes and blows them out the window. Not very good, but I do have big double doors. I've got three doors in my studio, so um, uh, it, that helps. Um, good lighting, and if you can't see, by all means, get an Optivisor. Um, I'm not yet there. I have bifocal contact lens and uh, three magnification glasses, which seem to work pretty well for me. But you need to see what you're doing. It's really important if you want to make pretty jewelry. Um, a, a good jewelry-making book, as you probably know if you have any, will start out with a bunch of uh, tools. So, so um, for example, this one. If you go to, let's see, the new encyclopedia of jewelry making tools, if you go to page five, it's going to right away start showing you some of the basic tools that you need. And I'm going to go over these with you. Rather than, so I'm going to move right in and kind of show you some of these tools that I have and how I use them. Okay. okay. So the, this is my torch. These are two torch setups, actually, and I don't want to confuse you, so I moved them away. These should be strapped down. I have them normally strapped against the side of my workbench, but I pulled them out so I could show you. This is just a little um, bucket. I, it's a trash bucket, but it was made nicely with the, the bends in them, and I just stick my two propane torches in there. Now, my first torch that I would recommend people start out with if you don't want to make a big investment and you're new to metal smithing because you can always add on to stuff. You don't need to go out and spend a ton of money. So this is an Ace propane cylinder. You can buy these. These are $4 a piece at the Ace hardware store. I'm, Home Depot has them. Other people have them. This little hose here that connects to it. The hose only was $14. And I separately bought a torch head uh, handle. And this torch head handle looks like this. And this one was, um, and then I think another $14, uh, $13.50 or something at Home Depot. So I have the one end of the hose connected to the torch head and the other connected to this single propane tank down here. Um, when I want to light this torch, um, I'll show you how to do that. The first thing I need to do is turn the propane on at the source. So I turn this all the way on. Then I can go up here to my torching station, which, by the way, I have just a big uh, tile, a ceramic tile underneath, and um, with no coating on it. I got from Home Depot for $1.99. And underneath my, sorry about this, hang on one second, let me try to get a better angle. Underneath this spins, this is an old pie tin I had, and I filled it with pumice. You can get pumice or vermic vermiculite from your garden nursery place uh, if you have a garden center um, and underneath that I have a spinner disc that I got from Amazon for $5.97. Home Depot has them too and sometimes I, I bury stuff in my pumice to solder so I use that and I put my brick right on top um, and I find that works really well and that way I can add other things too. But That is a really great way to start out. So here we are with my torch. Um, this is the really cheap torch that you can buy and 
thirty forty dollars everything's under forty dollars with the if you count this this and and the refillable tanks so in order to we turned on the bottom now we're going to um, turn this one on right here and I'm going to push the red and that is my torch you see the flame it's kind of a, a bit of a uh, it's, it's called a squirrel flame and I don't know how well you can see that but that is great to start out with it's nice and hot it melts metal. Um, can you see a little bit? Can do a tighter shot. Here I'm annealing a piece of metal. And you see it's going to red. And that's how you anneal a piece of metal. And then to turn it off, you just simply turn the turn the hose off torch and I still use that one to this day. Um, it's great if I don't feel like turning on my oxygen tank. <laughs> um, the other torch and once you get to be serious about metal smithing you're going to probably want to get a torch that has oxygen added to to the fuel. So um, a lot of people use acetylene and oxygen. Um, I prefer propane and oxygen. Um, number one, propane is much easier to get. You can get it at any hardware store in those little blue cans that I showed you. Um, acetylene is much harder to obtain, and I believe it's more expensive than propane. Propane you can get for about four bucks a can, as I mentioned, and uh, um, adding oxygen to the propane actually makes it really hot and um, very suitable for uh, enameling and, and, and soldering and everything else. And you'll be at the soldering station a lot, uh, you'll, you'll be in and out a lot quicker by using hotter fuel. And there's sometimes when you're doing a project and you just need hotter fuel, and you'll know when that is, and you'll say, thank goodness I have a good torch. So, um, this is my torch, it's called a Smith Little Torch, it's very small, and um, don't let the size fool you, it, uh, it's a really powerful little torch. Um, this tip is, um, tiny. It has uh, a variety of tips that come with it. I think they're, that's a number seven tip and these are the tips that come with it. Each one has a different size hole in the end um, depending on how big of a flame you need. I don't know if you can actually see a hole there and there's a little hole. Um, I, pretty, I don't change my tips too much um, unless I'm going to be doing enameling or some heavy um, pieces of metal work for that I would switch to this is a separate tip that I bought it's called a rosebud tip and you could buy this on Amazon or any welding supply we'll have it uh, weld fabulous is where I got my torch and they have really good prices on uh, the Smith little um, it actually this would screw off and this would screw on and then you would have this I think it's a really hot it's a big flame and it's it'll go to town with any other big torch so you need a lot of heat that's a good one and this is a great little torch um, the way you light your torch is the first thing you do is you have to turn on your oxygen tank and your propane tank so let me show you how to do that okay again here we are with uh, uh, the tank set up for the Smith little torch again I have my red hose connected uh, to one of these little uh, Home Depot or Ace Hardware their burns matic makes them um, with the disposable connection that comes with my, your Smith Little Torch. I think you can get it with uh, different connections, but I, when I first bought it, I used only disposable cans. Now you can also, for the oxygen when you start out, you can just get the same thing. It's a red can and it's an oxygen can for the other one. Um, so you, do, you can have both of your cans in a little trash can like I have them here. So one could be red and one could be your, your green. Your green. Um, but the oxygen air tanks, if you do a lot of soldering, you're going to go through them too fast. And the oxygen ones um, empty out quickly, and they're, they're about $10, $10 a piece, so it makes more sense to just move from your basic propane setup with your, your basic torch into an oxypropane or um, istisline, whatever you decide to use. But you'll need some oxygen to, to help make that gas hot. Um, this is a really easy setup, and um, if you want to send me a message, I'm more than happy to tell you how to do it. Um, so here, 
Um, I do not have a flashback arrester, though you should. I just haven't, I don't have one. Shame on me. But um, this little tiny oxygen tank, you can see how small it is. See my hand and see it compared to the other one. It's pretty small. You can go to your local hardware store and your hardware, or not hardware store, I'm sorry, your local welding store and your welding store will um, sell you a tank for about 80 bucks. This is called a 20 cubic foot tank. They come much bigger. I think they come up to 90 cubic feet or, or I'm not sure. Um, and they, you just take it in for a refill when it gets empty. Um, and they will refill it. Mine refills for about $30. This tank lasts me a long time and I burn a lot of oxygen. I do enameling and everything. So um, these are the regulators. What's nice about this tank is that it tells me how much oxygen I have left. So when it's full, it's up here. And when it's starts to get empty it gets down you know it, it goes from 80 to 40 down to 20 when it's down there it's gone so um, I know that I'm about to run out and I can finish my project whereas with the disposable ones you find out when they're gone that you're out um, but I always keep an extra one in the you know you see an extra tank over there I always have a few extra ones around since they're only four bucks for the propane uh, okay so when I want to use this tank the first thing I need to do is turn on uh, my my tanks so before I can use my Smith Little um, what I'll do is I'll go first and turn on my oxygen or my propane and you can see where it says on to the right off to the left I'm gonna turn it on I have to put it down the okay so I switch it to on and then I go to my oxygen tank and you see where it says close and open I'm gonna turn it open and again these should be strapped down mine are not strapped down you can just uh, strap it down connect it to your side of your bench or a wall or anything just to keep it from falling over um, okay so this is turned on and now this little thing don't let it intimidate you it's just it's a PSI regulator and all you need to do is turn it until it gets to about a number five so right there and that just controls PSI is pressures per square inch I think I'm not sure exactly, but um, it's how much pressure you want your oxygen to come out at. And so there, I'm good to go. Now, when I'm done soldering for the day, I turn off my tank. Some people leave theirs on. I turn off everything because I just don't. I, I'm working in a studio that's connected to my house, and I don't want any uh, any accidents. But I can leave that on for hours while I'm soldering and making pieces. And at the end of the day, I go back and turn it off. Um, so now I'm going to show you how to light my Smith Little Torch. So once your oxygen is turned on and your propane is turned on, you're ready to light your torch. You have red and you have green. The green always represents oxygen and the red always represents your fuel. Red is like caution, it's dangerous to inhale. Any kind of fume you should think of, it's going to be propane or isthaline depending on what you're using. I think natural gas is another gas that you can use too. Um, there are several ways to light your torch. Um, you can use a lighter, you can use a match. Um, the proper way is to use an igniter. Um, it just makes a flame. I'll show you how to use that. I prefer, if I'm doing a lot of uh, metalworking, uh, metal, I use a candle. Um, so I'm going to show you both ways. Um, the first thing you'll want to do is you want to turn on your propane. And in order to do that, is you want to turn on the red knob. Okay, so I'll let you zoom in here. So we're going to start with the red knob, and I'm going to, it's going to hiss a little bit, and I want to get the, the um, light really close to it. So you turn on the red knob, you get a little gas coming out, and I just put it right up to my candle, and boom, it's lit. Okay, and then um, I shorten the flame a little bit, I get it where I want it, and then I'll turn the green knob. The green knob is what adds oxygen and it's what makes it hot. Now watch how the flame tip changes and it'll get hotter because you'll see a more less yellow and more blue. So I'm going to turn my little green tip and the oxygen will start to come out and it's going to make my flame a lot, uh, a lot hotter. And if I turn the oxygen up, I'm going to get an even tighter flame. I know it's probably a little bit hard to see that. 
If I point it down, you can see it. Anyway, um, that is how you light the torch. When you're ready to turn the torch off, you turn the, the oxygen off first. So you turn off the air, same way you turned it on, and then you're left with a yellow flame. And then you turn off the, um, the fuel. Now I'm gonna light this with a striker so you can see the difference. Again, I'm just gonna turn on my propane and I'm gonna strike it and it's gonna go on. That's that simple. Then I'm going to bring my flame down again and I'm gonna add my oxygen. I'm get my nice tight little flame and I'm ready for soldering. I'm gonna see if I can get this close and you can watch the difference using this torch versus the propane torch. So I'm just going to take this torch. This torch is much, much hotter than because it has oxygen added. And so I don't need to get it and use as much work to get this metal hot. And you're going to see the metal turn cherry red a little bit quicker than you did with the other torch. So here we go. Just heating up my metal. And there it goes. I don't know if you can really see it very good in the camera, but it's, it's red. So this is a very, very, very wonderful setup. I can't say enough good things about my uh, my Smith torch. It's it's just been great. Um, I don't think I'd ever want to use another torch. Sometimes when I go to the college and they have the Estisling torches and the other ones, I say, oh, I wish I had my Smith little. So now again, I'm going to turn this off. And we remember, we always turn off the oxygen first. Turn that off, get our yellow flame, and then we uh, hit our propane and turn that off. So you're all done with that. Um, please remember when you're done with your torch for the day to turn off your tanks. And to turn off the tanks, we do the same thing we did before, only turning it off instead of on. Now one more thing I want to show you at the end of the day when you're ready to turn your tank off. So you turn your silver screw, you screw all the way so that it shows that it's closed. And then you'll go over and look, your PSI is still on 5. Um, when you turn on your oxygen tank, remember we said we wanted it to come up to about five. Um, uh, the pressure, the PSI is five, five, five pre number five on the pressure. So you want to get rid of that. And that's what this other silver knob down here is for. So this extra silver knob we haven't really talked about yet. I'm going to back out in the shot just so you can see it a little bit better. This, um, this turns the gas off and on, or the oxygen off and on. And this controls your PSI, the pressure of the, that the, it comes out. So at the end of the day, when you're all done, you've turned this off. You've turned off your propane tank. Everything's turned off. And you come back to, uh, you come back to this one, and you're going to want to take your torch and open up the oxygen only. It's called bleeding it out. So you're going to leave, and you can hear the hiss, and you see the PSI come down? It just came down to zero. So I'm just going to turn that in a little bit, and you can hear it come back on. Okay, see? So when I turn this down, I want this back down to zero, so there's no pressure. There's nothing pushing oxygen out, and then I'll go and turn this off. So see, ladies, it's very, very easy, ladies and gentlemen. I don't know if there's any gentlemen watching me. But these torches, don't let them intimidate you. If you can make a piece of jewelry, you can handle a torch. Um, and, and it's time to move on from the creme brulee torches if you want to make real jewelry and, and really get a, a good setup. And you, you won't regret it, especially if you're going to do any enameling or torch fire enameling or anything like that where you need a lot of gas. Um, map gas is bad stuff. It's stinky. It's nasty. It's highly dangerous. And, um, you know, you don't want to be sitting someplace where you've got a can of map gas blowing on uh, in your face unless you've got some seriously good ventilation. And I just don't like map gas. It's, it's, it's nasty stuff. I'm using a different brick than I was using before. And talk to you a little bit about some of the soldering tools that you're going to need. Um, so you're going to need a solder pick. The solder pick is used to um, move your solder around while you're soldering. Um, you're going to need solder. And I like to use wire solder. Wire solder comes in hard, easy, and medium. Um, and there are different types of solder, and they're for different things. I like to use hard solder as much as I can. Um, 
The reason being is because a hard solder is a higher silver content than medium or easy silver. And anytime I have maybe just doing a ring shank or something, just a, a one-time piece, I, I like as much silver on my piece as possible. If I'm do, working in sterling silver, I want to use hard. Um, it comes in a wire form, just like your, your wire that you buy for jewelry. And I put mine through a rolling mill to make it flat, but you can also, um, you can hammer it flat. And this one is flattened out. And then to use it, you would just take your cutters, and these are my favorite cutters, my Kiba Flush Cutters. These guys cut all my sterling silver, they cut my brass, my copper, my wire, they cut steel uh, wire, and my annealed steel wire, and they still s stay incredibly sharp. So I recommend that these, this is the kind of cutter, cutting tool you get for your wire and your solder, and you won't need anything else. Um, the way you do it is you just cut off a little chip, Put your finger over the end when you cut it, you snap it, and you're going to have a nice little piece of, well you can see that light is really bad in here, um, little solder chip. You can see it, it's right there. And um, the way that I like to keep my solder is in a little container marked hard, medium, and easy so that I know what is what um, when I'm when I need to, to get some solder, it's just easy to have it already cut up like this. Um, the next thing I like to do with my solder is I like to um, take a piece of it out. I always use uh, tweezers because of the way it's in the container. So I take a piece out and I drop it into a little plastic container like this. And I'm going to show you why I do that. So when I'm working on a project, I like to use Crips Flux. Um, this is not a real bottle of, of the original bottle of Prips Flux. Prips or Mighty Flux from Rio are kind of the same thing. Um, I take it out, it's yellow, and I put it in a, this is an old spray bottle. You can get a spray bottle anywhere. This used to be a Febreze bottle, and uh, I put my flux in there. And the reason I like to use this, I don't like Handy Flux. Handy Flux dries out, it's messy, and it leaves a lot of mess on my solder block. Um, so I prefer to use this one, and I'm going to just demonstrate how I use this one and um, to see if that might be something you're interested in. Uh, if you like to use a different type of, of flux, that's okay with you, but this is good for, um, it's okay for you, I should say, um, and this is good for um, any kind of metal. So let me just show you how it works. All right, so I'm just going to use my TB torch to show you this. I'm going to heat this metal up. The way that you do this, I'm not sure you can see that very well on the camera, is you heat up your metal first because you want to kind of get it a little bit warm. Your flux, and you spray it on. And you see how everything turns white? It's this nice white powder. Now I know when that white powder starts to turn clear that my solder should be ready to flow. So now I'm uh, okay, I can see it. My little solder is inside of here. You can see this. For two pieces of metal, this one is on there. It both got flux, and I want you to see it's hot again, so everything's white. So when this starts to turn clear as I'm outside, heat up the outside. And when this uh, white powder starts to go clear, that is a sign that my metal has reached the right temperature and that that is ready to, uh, solder's ready to flow. Hopefully you can see this. So I'm heating slowly around my piece. You can also use your turntable and turn it, but I want to keep this in your view here. So I'm just going to keep it like this. You can see that white is going away. So my metal is just about to turn clear. It's getting a little bit glassy. And now my solder, and if I had my solder pick, if I needed to move that solder around, I could do that at this point. Uh, let me get it up and show you how to do that. 
I'm not so sure you can see this very well. I have a pick to do that. So that's it. That's kind of uh, the way that I like to use um, my flux and my solder and my solder pick and, um, and cut it into little chips. Another tool that you may need if you're soldering two pieces together is called a third arm. I'm going to back this up so you can see a little bit better. And this is a third arm. It has a base and it has a tweezer on it. And you can use it to hold, uh, let's say I'm trying to solder two pieces of metal together. So there's one piece of metal and I could push this down onto here and use it to hold my metal so that I have a free hand. Um, you do have to be careful when you're using a third arm because they will make a bit of a heat sink. So um, you just don't want to get your flame uh, too much. Sometimes if you just feed the heat sink a little bit and then you go back and you solder. That's another, that's another video though. I just kind of wanted to give you a good idea of some of the tools you're going to use. Um, that is pretty much everything that I think you need to know uh, about your soldering station. If you have any questions, just send me a, an email or, or, or text me or find me on Facebook and I'll be happy to help answer. You've heated up a piece of metal is you're going to want to quench it. So you're going to take your metal and you're going to stick it in a quench pot. And I keep water, um, cool water or room temperature water and I drop my metal in there and that quenches it. Now the minute your metal is in your quench, it's okay to pick it up. It's cool. So you want to take your piece out of there, all the heat's come off, and you're going to put it into your pickle pot. Um, you can use copper tongs is what everyone recommends to use copper tongs to put your pieces into your pickle pot. Um, if you don't have copper tongs, copper tongs actually keep the uh, metal from reacting with the pickle. So you should never use anything except for copper, plastic, or wood. You can use a set of chopsticks. Um, you can use some, a plastic uh, tong also. Um, you drop it in and you let it set in your hot pickle pot. This is a mini crock pot. It's really tiny. I think they're like $7 on Amazon. Um, Bed Bath & Beyond has them. Walmart has them. They're really, really cute and tiny. This one's small. It has no dials on it or anything and, and this is what I use. Um, I also like to keep a, a plastic cup. This is just a laundry cup off my laundry detergent and I've drilled holes in it if you can see there and those holes keep let the, the the pickle run out so that when I pull it up out of the pickle I don't have to um, drain it and I don't have to use tongs if I just want to grab it quickly I can reach in and grab my piece I usually leave my piece in here for oh, you know a few minutes it doesn't take long now once you take your piece out of the pickle pot please don't throw it directly into a tumbler. Always use a brass brush to clean the fire scale off of it. If you don't use a brass brush on it before you put it into your tumbler, um, it's going to make your shot dirty. So just use a brush, brass brush. You should, the, the tumbler, which we're going to talk about next, is um, the tool you use for burnishing and shining your metal and making your metal all pretty and clean and sparkly. Um, after you've done your your soldering. So it's kind of one of the last steps you'll do before you do a stone set and, and you'll get your metal all nice and clean or if you're all finished with your piece, um, metal clay or whatever it is you're working on, you want to put it into a tumbler or you can hand polish it, but I really recommend going to Harbor Freight and getting their $50 tumbler. I also have a lower tone tumbler. I didn't like my lower tone tumbler because my belt was never tight enough and my it wouldn't turn my, my drum. Um, and I was always fidgeting with it and it didn't have an on off switch so I got myself a Harbor Freight tumbler. I highly recommend them. They're made by Chicago um, Tool Company and they are US made so I like it. Anyway, um, but you can use whichever one you want. Um, when you get a tumbler um, you're going to want to buy steel shot. Now, everybody asks me what kind of steel shot do you use? What kind of shot do you use in your tumbler? If you want to burnish your metal, and burnishing is when you're rubbing metal against metal or steel against metal, it makes your, your, your pieces sparkly and shiny. And so the type the best shot for that is, um, this is from Rio Grande. It's just called steel shot. And I want you to really notice the shape of it because the shape of it is what works, what makes it work. So this is... Um, it's got balls and spikes and tubes in it, and or little barrel shapes. 
and these rubbing against your metal is what makes it um, clean and shiny and sparkly and saves you all that if you want to get a high finish that you can do it with your tumbler also it work hardens in your metal if you leave it in there long enough um, so what you would do is just take your your jewelry you put put your jewelry inside and you would add a drop of Dawn dishwashing, one drop of Blue Dawn dishwashing detergent, and just put water in it until it covers your, your jewelry, usually about a half an inch above your jewelry, um, or the highest part of metal in there. And you put your lid on it, and you'll have a lid that looks like this, and it'll kind of snap in there. But again, don't put anything with fire scale. Clean it off before you put it in, and it'll make your shot dirty. And then you put the lid on it, and there'll be a little screw that you screw up right on top of here. It's actually a silver disc that goes on here too. Where's my silver disc? Well, I don't know where that silver disc is, so right now we'll just do it this way. And then you put it into the barrel. And I'm going to show you that right now. So this is my uh, Chicago Rotary Tumbler. It's a three pound tumbler. Um, I use one pound a shot and I turn it on right here. You can hear it going around. It's going to start um, cleaning my, my metal for me. It's going to make it nice and shiny. It's going to save me all that polishing work. And my sterling silver, brass, and copper are going to come out looking really nice. So that's how that works. I've owned two of them, and within a month, each one of them broke. Um, and they didn't really have enough power. So I am more of a fan of a, of a, a 1.4 amp kind of a rotary tool. This one I've had for years, and... Uh, I paid $29 for it at a Osh uh, Christmas sale or something, and uh, it's just amazing. It has as much power, it seems like, <laughs> maybe not quite as much, but it's powerful, almost as powerful as my Fordham. Sometimes I feel like it's more powerful. It's, it's pretty strong. Um, and I'll just turn it on, and you'll be able to tell. Now, this, this little tool in the end is a polishing tool. You can put drill bits in here. Um, you can use these... Uh, scrubby they're like um oh gosh they're like they're like mm, uh, steel wool uh, but they're not steel wool i don't know what they are but they're great for cleaning off fire scale they're great for sanding and filing and cleaning um and you can use all of your your burrs and your your tools that you're going to need for stone setting um, you can use in here. Now I have a Fordham flex shaft and a rotary tool. I usually use this one for um, you know rounding off an edge, a grinding tool I might put in here and I use my Fordham for things like drilling and burrs and, and that sort of thing um, because it's just more of a precision piece. I really love my Fordham and if you can afford one someday I suggest you get one. You know they do make like dental dental ones you can find on eBay that are probably around a hundred dollars hundred and twenty I think I paid two fifty for this one two hundred and fifty dollars they're not cheap um, I have the Fordham SR and it has a reverse and a um, a forward on it and if I use my pedal it has a pedal which I'll try to zoom down there I don't know if you can see the pedal my feet can you see that there's a pedal I step on the pedal and makes it go makes, makes my tool go spin around um, it has a chuck with it and I'm sorry this video is really bad right here um, it has a chuck tool that you have to use the chuck tool is for taking out your drill bits or your burrs so you would use this to unscrew you can see how it opens up there and when you turn it um, and you can put in your bit or your tool and you tighten it back up again. And if I needed to clean a piece of metal, let's say I've got this one that's really, really full of fire scale, the one we just did. I haven't put my pickle yet. Um, you see how it's red there? And if I take this and I go across, it's going to get clean real fast. So you can see how these tools work. Um, same with this one. This is also a polishing tool. I love these tips. They're called 
Timo tips and you can find them on Amazon. Now they're soft, there's some sort of like a rubber tip, but they're great for polishing and they get little grooves in them and they're, they're just awesome. Um, Fordham doesn't make a tool like this and uh, Amazon is the only one I've ever seen it. But it's great for polishing edges or corners. I'm gonna turn this tool on and just show you. Um, you're gonna hear how powerful it is. It's on a one, there's a two. It's on a six, now I never, and um, it's a great tool. So either one, if you can't afford afford them, get a tool like this. The hard part about a tool like this is you can't really hold it very good for drilling. Um, this one, if I put a drill on it and I want to drill a piece, I can just drill right down and I can get a really straight cut. So if you're going to be doing like stone settings where you're going to use burrs, if you can't afford a Fordham flex shaft, get yourself a drill press. Um, because you're not going to be able to do it with a, with a rotary tool. And the drill press, um, I have one back there. Let's see if I can zoom in on it for you. Mm, drill press. There you are. It's this guy right here. Let's see if I can zoom in. Tight. That is a drill press. It has a little drill on the bottom, and it keeps your uh, your your drill bit nice and straight so if you're burring or anything like that that's the tool to have if you can't afford to afford them all right a lot of information okay so we covered most of the big stuff your soldering setup your oxypropane setup your torches your soldering uh your soldering station we talked about um using rotary tools we talked about your fordham flex shaft and your tumbler and your pickle. So that was quite a bit of, of stuff to pack into a, uh, a long video. We're going to do a part two that you can look for after this video and that will go into the hand tools that you need. Okay, thank you for me on Etsy. I've got an Etsy store. It's Leslie Villarreal, all one word, V-I-L-L-A-R-R-E-A-L. And also you can find me, uh, I have a blog, Leslie R, like Robert, the letter R, Leslie R Villarreal dot blogspot dot com. I'll put some links below at the bottom. And uh, you can find me on Flickr if you want to look for me there, Leslie R Villarreal on Flickr. And um, I'm on Facebook. I've got a fan page, Leslie Villarreal Handmade Jewelry on Facebook. Click the like button and give me some love, okay? All right, guys. Talk to you soon and look for the...